If you're an American conservative, you know that the societal values we hold sacred are under attack. They are hanging in the balance. How can you protect those values? By staying informed. The closing argument will deliver news and supporting evidence you need to support and defend those values. Here's Paul Smith. Good morning. This is Paul Smith, your host of The Closing Argument. In this podcast, we will discuss some of the important but controversial moral, legal, and political issues that affect us and our families today. Some of the things that we discuss are not politically correct, but we will discuss them anyway. We need to do this to preserve our liberties, to establish the truth, and to let the world know that there are many people who challenge some of the views that have gained acceptance in our schools, our media, and our government. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about the history of the climate change hoax, how it came about, and, and the history of how it has been exposed. I'm going to mention some things that many of you have already heard of, but I'm going to include them in a hopefully concise discussion that will be very helpful to you. First of all, let me mention a couple of things. Uh, I have discussed climate these climate change issues with two scientists that are pretty sharp, uh, one of whom has published peer-reviewed articles for a number of years, a plant geneticist, another one who is a PhD microbiologist from, from Yale University. Both are sharp individuals. And, and the interesting thing about my discussion with them is they are reluctant, in, in my opinion, to express a, an overall opinion about climate change. And I think the reason is they are experts in their field. And once you're an expert, you are reluctant to draw conclusions without having fully examined the basis for it. And they have their particular fields. And so they're just reluctant to go out on a limb and and get into things over their head. They don't want to mess up their credibility. And and they're just very thorough, uh, good scientists. Uh, As I presented my material to them, they did not present material to me to undermine or really even challenge my conclusions. But I mention that because I think as you talk to people about climate change, when you get to people who are really expert, you will find this reluctance to to adopt things that they're not sure of. Uh, Second thing I'd like to point out is how the how climate change has become politicized is in large part due to the governmental funding. And uh, unfortunately or not, it has become politicized. Uh, If you were to do some research on any number of topics, you got to get funds for it. And a lot of this funding comes from the government and the government controls who gets the money. So right now, uh, a lot of this funding is controlled by people who subscribe to the climate change view that humans are causing it. So if you propose research on a subject that's in line with that, you're more likely to get it. And so this this government involvement in science is actually has become counterproductive and is participating in this this disinformation. Now, having said that, in this discussion today, we are going to discuss about 10 different parts of the uh, climate change hoax history including how it developed and and how it has been exposed. We're going to talk about the IPCC, what it is, the Santer study, the Mann study, the rebranding that occurred, the Inconvenient Truth book and movie by Al Gore, the Supreme Court case of Massachusetts versus the EPA, the Minority Report of 2008, Climate Gate of 2009, the Paris Climate Accords, and the Green New Deal. So let's get into this right away. Uh, The IPCC, which we talked about in one of the other programs, is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It was formed in uh, 1988 by the UN. And for those of you who remember that era, it it came on the the heels of of the exposure of hydrofluorocarbons as being very dangerous to our atmosphere and climate. Hydrofluorocarbons are used in styrofoam containers. And at that time, and it's like 1987, McDonald's was using them for their sandwiches. And because of 
the exposure of how bad the hydrofluorocarbons were, <clears throat> McDonald's stopped using them and other companies did too. Uh, there's been a comeback, but but the uh, but that was a, an era and a regarded as a great international success as the world combined to say, hey, we got to cut back on these um, styrofoam containers because they harm the environment. So in 1988, the UN formed this uh, panel to show that uh, humans were causing damages to our climate and and causing global warming. Itso Carter and Singer said that the IPCC was crippled at birth because it was mandated by the UN that it defined climate change as human cause. And from 1996 to about 2010, there were like six or seven different studies that have exposed the many flaws of the IPCC. There was a study by Seats in 1996, by Linzen in 2012, Toll 2014, Stavins 2014, and a book uh, of rigorously researched book by Patrick Michaels. Dr. Spencer says that the IPCC is primarily a political adv advocacy group that cloaks itself in the aura of scientific respectability while it cherry picks the science that best supports its desired policy outcomes and marginalizes or ignores science that might contradict the party line. Spencer calls this a perversion. And uh, so from here, uh, I'll, let me mention one other group. In 2010, the Amsterdam-based Inter Academy Council, IAC, made a report that audited IPCC findings and concluded that it had serious defects, including fake confidential interviews, too much reliance on unpublished and non-peer-reviewed sources, political interference, the use of secret unshared data, selecting contributors based upon political views, and excluding opposing views. The IPCC basically has no credibility. One of the problems with this is the funding cycle. It's the, the government has been so politicized in science that it has, and, and many of the agencies have adopted the climate change, uh, human caused climate change being a problem, and they are financing studies that support that conclusion. If you were to want to publish a study that challenged or refuted that, you'd have great difficulty getting, uh, getting publication because uh, the government and, and its political views are now controlling research. So this is something that is going on and it's a real part of this problem. It's why the climate change hoax has gained so much momentum and why it has been, has been difficult to challenge and, and, uh, and refute some of its unscientific sign findings. The, I think what's happened, the IPC had hoped and believed that the science would support it's, you know, it's theor theoretical conclusion that humans were causing devastating uh, destruction to the earth, but the science has not supported it. It has actually refuted it, as we've discussed in some of our other, other studies. Um, we mentioned the Santer study before. This was a 1995 study by... Um, by Benjamin Santer, who, who concluded that, this, that there was a great degree of global warming going on, and it was alarming to him. The problem with his study is that the time he started and ended his study, there was warming, but immediately before and immediately after, there was cooling. And, it, and his study, the, the time he picked, basically then misrepresented what was going on. A similar problem with the Mann, Michael Mann study that uh, appeared in 1998, his has been dubbed the hockey stick because he showed gradual warming for a period of time and then a very sharp decline, uh, uh, incline that is the, you know, the, the up part of the hockey, hockey stick. But again, his problem had the same, his study was subject to the same problem, A, 
from 1998 when he ended his study to 2014, the temperatures were flat and it, it um, undermined his conclusions. He was also criticized for some of the, the, uh, some of the aspects of his study. He, his, his study uh, of a globing trend covered many years, I think hundreds of years, and he did not account for the little ice age occurred in the 1800s and some other things. So his has been disputed. We talked about that in another program. Uh, following that in 2000, 2006, we have uh, Al Gore came out with his book, uh, Inconvenient Truth. And in that book, he again said that humans were causing, causing global warming and climate change. And the book was made into a film. It even won him an Academy Award and a Nobel Peace Prize, the latter of which he shared with the IPCC. It was an extremely effective tool in increasing and, and uh, maintaining the hysteria of the environmental extreme, extremists. He said, we're at a tipping point. And he said, we have to take drastic measures or within 10 years, we're going to have a catastrophe. So that was 2007. It's interesting how the two, the 10 year threat seems to come up. He was not the first to, to announce a 10 year threat. Someone had done it before him. And then more recently, uh, Alexandria Ocasio, Ocasio Cortez has talked about it and others in connection with the Green New Deal. And that was beginning in 2010. They're talking about 10 years. They just, excuse me, 2020. So they continue to just totally pick 10 years out of the blue. There's no scientific data to support the 2000 and, uh, or the 10 year, 10 year uh, deadline. Um, Dr. Spencer calls uh, Al Gore's book a disinformation campaign based on a litany of scientific half truths, exaggerations, and inaccuracies. Uh, the science actually undermines and actually refutes the findings of Gore. Lord Christopher Morton told the U.S. Congress in 2009, the right response to the non-problem of global warming is to have the courage to do nothing. This is 2006 when this book came on the scene. About that time, and even a little earlier, the environmentalist movement began to change. For years, for the first 10 or 15 years, it was the global warming was the mantra it marched under. But as the global warming uh, was disproved, as I said, the, there was no global warming for at least 10 years in the first part of the 21st century. But they, they just adapted the, the mantra of climate change and have marched forward. And as we discussed before, that really is a brilliant move because climate change is so vague and broad, you cannot, it's hard to disprove it. Of course, they can't prove it either. And in fact, the human catastrophic part of it has been refuted by science. In 2007, uh, the Supreme Court entered into the fray and made a contribution that has really been very helpful to the environmentalists, but it is legally and factually flawed. I won't get into some of the legal aspects of it. I am an attorney and that when I when it was first decided in 2007, I read it, I, I just shook my head. I could not believe. Uh, basically, the Supreme Court justices took a case by dispensing with the laws of standing that they had, that they had honored for years and and because they wanted to take the case. So they took the case and then they said CO2 is a pollutant. I mean, that is a ridiculous, ignorant conclusion. That's like saying oxygen or water are pollutants. I mean, I guess you could drown, so then, then I guess water becomes bad, and I guess you can get too much oxygen. But the fact is, you need CO2 for plant life. Plants cannot live without it. And we are up to, as I've discussed on another program, a little over 400 parts per million in our atmosphere today. But uh, there is scientific evidence that that maybe 1,200 parts per million or three times what we've got now would really be good for plants. And there's no evidence that that would be harmful to humans. So um, 
the anyway that